Our final speaker is Jeremy Mansfield, OAM, who is the Sustainability Manager, Queensland and Northern Territory with Lend Lease. He'll be talking to us about maximising the benefits for commercial construction adoption of, of mass engineered timber. Um, and Jeremy, I know you stepped out of your role with uh, with the work one of the working groups today, and you're you're wearing a, a different expert's hat. So thank you for that flexibility. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Hudson. Just checking you can see the screen, okay? Can see and hear you. Great. Uh, just bear with me a second. Excellent. And uh, yeah, great examples there, Karen. Too. I uh, just thought that just uh, kind of elevates the conversation I want to now have around talking a bit more about some of the benefits. So I'm going to take you through um, a few things around our working with timber. Um, talk a bit further about the key benefits and what's next on our horizon in terms of taking that to the next level. So our history of mass engineered timber projects actually dates back to 2009. Um, so it's actually taking uh, more than a decade now that we've been involved with uh, now some uh, 20, 22 projects globally to date. Uh, quite a lot in Australia, but also some in the United States and in the UK. It all started actually back in 2009 uh, through to about 2012, where we were starting to explore um, the need for lighter weight construction alternatives for a key site which had poor ground conditions. So that particular site was for the Docklands development, which is built on a uh, Cody Island silt. And the building in the top corner there, Forte, was the residential building that was undertaken on that project and responded to um, the, ability, the need for a lightweight um, development on that site. So that started the journey of learning how do we adopt uh, mass engineered timber projects in our business. And there on the screen are a snapshot of those from the, uh, the Forte to the Docklands Library, International House, Dharmaru, 25 King, and uh, Anu Fenna House. Um, the other ones being um, international projects as well. So the types of engineered, mass engineered timber projects we've done have come into three forms. Um, certainly the Forte one, which is a panelised CLT type um, structure, um, and that's very typical of the residential type projects. The commercial projects follow a post and beam methodology. And then we have some of the modular type ones, which represented kind of sales suites and the smaller ones that are a bit like your um, Osgo site shed type things where they're very much more modular in, in those scale. So those, those kinds of um, types of application have been very typical across the, the types of projects that we've undertaken. In terms of the type of timber, we, it has been mentioned before, but maybe just to, to reinforce the definitions a bit further between the difference between cross laminated timber and glue lamb. Um, the other one that we've uh, applied on our projects is a laminated veneer. Um, this is where we've actually introduced this into penetrations within the glue lamb that provide a significant more um, strength through those large, larger penetrations. So those particular three types of, um, types of timber production um, have been mentioned before and, and obviously just showing that there's um, differences with respect to those as, as detailed there. In terms of how timber responds to very things that we, we care about, um, I think it was probably worth mentioning these three things around uh, fire in terms of timber has a very predictable performance. So we know through testing that it has a very understood burn rate in terms of how the sacrificial layer gets impacted through fire and allows us to make sure that we can develop fire engineered solutions as to, to ensure that we understand the predictable nature of uh, fire um, in a timber mass engineered timber building. Certainly for durability and termites, the same rules apply in terms of methodologies that uh, support managing both the durability through design uh, features like separation and ventilation and membranes, et cetera, as well as in terms of termite protection, the, the levels of separation um, and things like the, the degree of concrete structure that's provided up to level one podium level to make sure that there's a physical separation with regard to that and the typical other inspection regimes apply. 
In terms of key benefits, um, look, there's a range of ones and they've been mentioned well. Um, Karen, you, you mentioned obviously six great e examples of, of, of measuring some of those and I will kind of repeat some of those, but there'll be some other ones that hopefully are, are different to those. In, uh, these were all mentioned before, I think, in terms of, yes, it's a renewable material, uh, it can be responsibly sourced and it's important, and uh, Steve mentioned that, that we are critically ensuring that we are getting verification of that and also getting validation of their environmental product declarations, particularly at the supplier level. For us, that gives us more certainty to, to apply that in our life cycle assessments. That recognition of the significant reduction in carbon as compared to obviously concrete and steel structures, the, the good thermal performance um, properties, and that indoor environment quality being um, very important as well. And certainly the industry has transitioned itself over the last decade to ensuring low VOC applying of adhesives in their products. One example of uh, projects I thought was worth sharing was 25 King. It is Australia's tallest commercial office timber building, 10 storeys high, um, some 14,000 odd square metres. Uh, so this included cross-laminated timber uh, across slabs and feet, lift cores and fire stairs, uh, and all the structure above level one, one structure other than the roof, um, roof area. Uh, so it um, has really uh, came about through both, uh, all three parties from developer, investor and tenant really driving to want to be a part of this iconic building. The significant reduction in carbon is recognised here, the 38.7% embodied carbon reduction um, is, is, has been verified through our life cycle assessment and acknowledging that sequestration when included would actually account for doubling that account um, in terms of that extent. In terms of some timber facts, um, this is about 10 times the size of some, some of the other examples shown. It's, it's the quantum of timber here, I think at the time, and, and Kate Fowler will probably correct me, I don't believe there was any capacity in the industry to supply this project at the time in an Australian context. That's changing in terms of the available supply and it's still probably still a stretch, but the volume of, of glue lamb and CLT on this product and on this project was is very significant in terms of the scale of uh, timber elements um, supplied for this project. And obviously just recognising that it was sustainably sourced, PFC certified and verified EPD timber for all of the all of its supplied timber. Uh, Steve mentioned the, the life cycle assessment boundary, and it's probably important to know that um, in undertaking the life cycle assessment, we're aligned to the 60 year life of the building and picking up um, the acknowledgement of uh, the different parts of the, the cycle um, through, uh, through to construction. Um, but importantly, highlighting that beyond 60 years, we have had to make assumptions in terms of what happens to that uh, particular um, building after that. And it's interesting that, um, the, uh, as uh, Stephen mentioned, it's a bit of a challenge in terms of some of the, the end of use of life and who's accounting for that, because we're unable to account for that within our boundary. Uh, it, it is also interesting to note that transport impacts here were almost equal to that of the building products. Uh, the transport of the, of the CLT from Europe um, does have a significant impact. However, the, the pre fabrication of the products and the reduction in transport to site uh, for activities has actually also reduced it. So there's a kind of a double impact there. Uh, some insights from that learnings, I think it was worthwhile showing some of this to kind of highlight that there is a need to understand balancing uh, manufacturing and, and transportation packs, as I mentioned before. We've certainly optimised containerising of that through sea freight for the international supply on this project but it does still highlight that that was a significant impact compared to the overall product uh, accounting, accounting for the, for the carbon of the products. Uh, so uh, it certainly definitely helped to have optimised the freight, but uh, it certainly highlights the, the to need to understand the, the extent of prefabrication and the opportunities that um, local supply can support uh, improving that reduction in impact. Um, there are other things there to consider. The end of life process is being one of those key issues to determine and in terms of what um, assumptions have been made. And certainly um, it's been brought up before around the sequestration issue um, in terms of who owns that biogenic carbon and the accounting of that through chain of custody. 
and also that yeah the uh, the renewable resource is a 30 year process for growing so there is a time lag in terms of a carbon sink and, and that sequestration so there's things for us to kind of understand and account for as well in terms of investor benefits there are uh, a broad range of benefits here in terms of uh, work, better working environments for occupants to provide productivity and, and wellbeing gains and I'll touch on that in a minute there's certainly um, it's the profile of these timber buildings has a very high profile in terms of a commercial building, for example, and certainly that has led to investor interests. Um, it's also led to high returns and low vacancy rates through tenants prepared to pay more for a timber building and also higher demands for timber buildings uh, supporting kind of lower vacancy rates. The award and recognition um, of these buildings has been second to none in terms of uh, identifying what, what they have achieved in, in kind of um, signaling to the market what what good practice can look like with mass engineered buildings, um, recognising that 25 King was one of those that have been recognised internationally as one of the best tall buildings under 100 metres globally. And certainly that means that they become a market differentiator in a, in a marketplace that has uh, vacancy rates and a competition for tenants and investors. In terms of building performance, they're as durable as traditional construction forms, the same design life warranties and performance criteria under the building code apply and there are no additional outgoings to account for uh, compared to traditional buildings. One of the key interesting benefits, and it goes back to the original Forte project, is the lightweight structure benefits. Um, I've used this slide to highlight a couple of things here to show that 25 Kim was actually built over a tunnel. Um, and so the need for a very lightweight structure and not having to spend a significant foundation bridging and even the ability to put a decent size scale 10 storey building on this was very much um, an, an important consideration in terms of that. And certainly also highlights that um, less mass makes it easier to control from a seismic and wind conditions, obviously still needing bracing to be addressed, but certainly highlights that um, there are significant benefits in terms of having a lightweight structure for both um, poor land or bridging over uh, tunnels and other considerations that really looks at the whole of life cost of the, um, I'm sorry, whole, the whole of construction cost, not just looking at the, the structure itself, but the implications of foundations and other things you might need to consider in the ground. I uh, mentioned before uh, in one of the other projects was about dematerialization benefits of having no ceilings. And certainly those kinds of examples here apply as well in terms of the open, open plan offices with exposed ceilings and exposed services, meaning that there's a lot less uh, materials used and less coordination issues in terms of the ceiling, but uh, still lots of coordination to make sure that the, uh, the exposed services are well installed um, and uh, that um, you yeah, certainly savings there in terms of less materials. Mentioned before was the benefits of biophilic and the connection to nature. And there's been a number of really good studies to highlight um, the extent to which wood has an impact on the working environment and also people's physical and mental health. And these kind of highlight um, the kind of different things there from uh, the visibility of that to the physical connection to it, to the levels of stress that can be impacted to reduce your, your heart rate and actually allow you to concentrate better and improve productivity. A further study went a bit uh, along the same lines, but highlighted just how important that biophilia and the, connect in the connection to nature is important to humans and how it can have cognitive, psychological and emotional energy and be a charging station to actually support uh, uh, individuals. And I guess from an organisation as well as a, a staff perspective, that provides a, a really great um, connection to supporting the wellbeing if you're driving and supporting uh, these timber buildings with your developments for staff. Uh, aligned to that, uh, Oricon were very driven to want to be a part of that to support the positive working environment for their staff. There are also a lot of improved safety benefits by using mass engineered timber. The, the, the nature of the prefabrication and the way in which we go about undertaking that work has seen a significant reduction of injuries from formwork and reinforcing because we're eliminating some of those things significantly from the work site. The working environment becomes a much more uh, cleaner, dust-free, less vibration and noise impact, 
And certainly we've noticed that the projects where they're adjacent to, to other um, uh, facilities, whether that be residential or otherwise, that complaints from neighbours become um, a thing of the past. There are no noise complaints. The sites are quiet, they're clean, respected. And I think that kind of highlights the fact that timber, as you start to build with this at that scale, um, the, the, the workers have a very strong respect for it. There's, there's also a significant reduction or elimination of hot works through elimination of many of the other componentry that doesn't require that now. And obviously a transition to lightweight battery powered tools and not having the need for high voltage site tools. Simple um, cordless drills, albeit the best cordless drills you can find that have the ability to put in very large screws are really important. Um, but also the practice of how we go about installing uh, the panel systems uh, through the pre-installed perimeter handrails um, and not having live edges and having our safety nets, you can see there in the pink, uh, really having a very safe uh, working environment to, for teams to work with. Uh, as mentioned before, there are a lot of prefabrication benefits from um, not having as much uh, materials on site and obviously being prefabricated. Um, the example used here that the significant reduction in waste to landfill uh, is quite um, profound compared to uh, common waste uh, extent on uh, traditional construction. And certainly the, the speed of construction is significantly faster when comparable in that construction phase to traditional steel and concrete buildings. Um, certainly uh, through the introduction of uh, a BIM model as well as uh, a methodology of um, installation that allows for bolted connections, the easier to mount disassembly uh, and reuse is, is far more uh, uh, possible through that process. One interesting note here, we did actually find a waste stream that we didn't think we'd have, which was some of our waste diligers for the timber packaging, um, but we did found a use with the local TAFE to use in their training of carpenters to actually support their understanding of being a part of the timber industry. In terms of another project that provided a few other examples worth sharing um, was Dumaru House, our most recent commercial office building next to its sister in International House. Um, and a project which uh, the investors and teams wanted to get on and start to build straight after the they finished International House. This project represented a significant 25% uh, reduction in embodied carbon. Um, and so uh, it, it uh, demonstrated it uh, met the commitment of Barangaroo South in terms of a more than 20% reduction. Um, as you can see there, the volume of uh, CLT was significant less than the 10 storey building but no less of, of an impact in terms of uh, uh, its, its ability to, um, I, think, uh, I think this particular project as a regrowing re time, it was something like 12 hours during, uh, during the summer months. So more than the 45 minutes of the other project, but obviously the volume of uh, material here is a lot more than that. One of the most interesting aspects on this project was reclaiming of hardwood columns, sorry, the, uh, uh, telegraph poles and uh, piles in the ground uh, for the structure and finishes. Uh, the piles, I believe, were in the ground from about the 1920s. And so they've been in the mud uh, about, a, about 100 years. And so pulling them out about 2014, they managed to salvage it and um, enable them to be reused as part of the project in terms of um, linings and into the foyer and ceilings. So a really great story in terms of the reuse of that. And I believe and Joe, you'll probably ask this question in terms of the sequestration. We were able to include that within our LCA as part of the taking to the next project in terms of its reuse as a contribution to our uh, embodied carbon reduction. The other thing that was different from uh, 20 by King, uh, which actually I think was an eight by six rather than nine by six, I'm not area there, but this one had a nine by nine grid, uh, which provided some different um, uh, arrangement that provided uh, a better reticulation and tenant flexibility and reduced a number of elements um, to actually what they might have done otherwise done. Uh, did highlight to a lessons learned after this that the sweet spot is probably somewhere around a nine by six grid, somewhere somewhere between the two, between 25 King, which is eight by six, and this at nine by nine, the nine by six uh, starts to indicate a more efficient um, uh, approach to the next opportunity. So that leads us to what's next. And I think this kind of highlights the kind of where are we going with some of uh, our thinking around how do we take that next uh, 
leap of um, understanding of what we've learned from our 22 buildings into the next generation of uh, mass engineered timber buildings. One such area is our Podium MX Studio team who are very focused on things like safe access, system integration and speed of installation. And this is just some examples of the methodology they're going through to look at um, very specific systems with suppliers to understand how to set up um, better systems and better connections and better methodologies for production, uh, assembly on site and disassembly. Um, so a lot of detail work there that I won't go into detail with, but highlighting that we are really very focused on a lot of core principles there and looking at the, the focus on, our, on, on the, uh, the manufacturing side of things. In terms of other considerations with timber and low carbon materials going forward, we do need to recognise um, that every project is different and we start, need to start to uh, utilise the best of the material ca characteristics for application. Uh, certainly once you get above a certain size height of, of timber building, it makes more sense to use it for its, its, its best purposes where it makes the most difference in it, and carbon reduction impact and other um, characteristics rather than trying to shoehorn its use for um, purposes that might be better off undertaken through other material selections. I um, did want to highlight that there really, there really is a need to, to understand the change in design philosophy around the early design freeze to make sure that you can then um, lock in the fabrication um, uh, through to um, production because uh, this really is a fundamental change in terms of how traditional construction has worked in the past. Um, you know, very, very much, uh, you know, receiving late uh, construction documentation that uh, reflects kind of just in time on site, but doesn't necessarily work very well with the need for prefabrication and, and, and the like and the time that needs uh, to happen for that. So degree of fabrication, prefabrication is, is only growing in terms of opportunities. It does mean and a change to labour and the types of work being undertaken. Um, there is an increased reliance on planning and logistics, um, and it's very much an assembly rather than construction methodology. Uh, there's certainly very much an opportunity for local supply of, uh, in, in this regard, and very excited for the work that uh, Exxon and other organisations are starting to do to scale up their capacity to, to service the, the growing need within the Australian industry. Uh, just reflecting on the, the, the shift of prefabrication from traditional design processes, and really just wanted to highlight the difference that we think both the Podium MX, the kit of parts and the componentry that they're looking at, um, and the way in which we need to lock in the level of detail prior to construction starts to identify that you may need some more time up front, um, but it will be a, a reduction in time in construction. So there is um, uh, quite a, a shift there in terms of um, bringing on board and understanding how that, that methodology needs to get to lock in kind of the design earlier, as well as kind of the opportunity to um, think about the, the production process using you know, standardised componentry rather than uh, a, longer, a longer process of um, design valuation or de development. So this is all very aligned to our Mission Zero that Lendlease has in terms of our 1.5 aligned uh, objective uh, or to setting ourselves ambitious site-based emissions reduction targets. We do see that timber uh, has a very important part to play and is a key step towards eliminating our scope three emissions and achieving our absolute zero carbon by 2040 target. So I hope that provides some insight in terms of how we've utilised uh, mass engineered timber buildings to date, the kinds of benefits we've seen with uh, undertaking those and the kind of some of the insights of actions we're taking going forward. So with that, I think I'm done, Hudson. Fantastic, Jeremy, thank you very much. Um, so, so many interesting insights from a, a breadth of experience, 25 timber projects globally is quite a portfolio to, to be able to talk from there. So that's great. Uh, just anecdotally, I've got friends who work in the King Street building and they're not technical, they're not sustainability guys, they just love it. So it, it did you from a tenant's perspective and you talked about the market drivers, the, the, the reduced vacancy, the increased desire for the investors, um, a, a, a lot of benefits there. Yeah, I, I did actually forget to mention that there is a bit of a, um, a behaviour trait that you do find in um, 
in 25 King as, as, as well as some of the other timber buildings, you have a very common uh, feature of people going and hugging columns um, because they're beautiful. Uh, yeah. You just, you, you, they are just, yeah, you do kind of tend to fall in love with them, to be honest. And mm. so um, it, is a, it is a wonderful feature to, um, to reflect on, I think. And I, I, uh, um, I think it's, it's one of the beauty things that uh, timber buildings do have. And maybe I didn't reflect that in my slides properly, but certainly uh, timber does have an innate beauty to it that you really do, uh, do love. Yes, well, you and, and Karen both mentioned the biophilic connection to nature as one of the benefits. And I hadn't thought about hugging a, a timber column that really takes loving. They're pretty hard to get yourself around. A whole level. But look, also, I hadn't thought about the, the benefits of, of site safety, just the different tools that are needed and the benefits that might bring, and the less noise for those around. My gosh, that's, that's a big advantage. I'd love it if my neighbours had all timber and wouldn't bloody drill into the masonry all the time. So... I can see that there's a real noise acoustic benefit there too.